thank you for asking me to participate in this. And um, I would say this is probably the biggest choice I, as an ophthalmologist, have ever had to make, is choosing a lens. I developed a PSC cataract, actually bilateral PSC cataracts. And I have been asking myself and every one of you at every meeting, what lens would you put in your own eye if you should develop a cataract? I've come every year, I've asked. The, the answers have changed every year. <laughs> and so therefore, I never really had a perfect answer. And the other problem was I was in the United States where we don't have the same choices that you do. So I had the choice of doing it there and continuing my work and not having to be interrupted or coming here and finding one of you and picking the lens that I haven't had personal experience with and not knowing and knowing my personal you know, intricacies of what I wanted. So what I sort of boil down is to ask, what do we want most? What do we want least? What can we live with and what can't we live with? And do we even know these answers? And I will tell you, you do not know these answers until you undergo this yourself. First, are you still operating? Will we have glare in the microscope? How would we know in advance? Will we have degradation of image quality? How about if we drive at night a lot, which I do? Would we tolerate glare or halo? Do we know or can we test it? How different is glare than halo? And would we tolerate coma, trefoil, or starbursts? How important is it to have near vision and at what cost? Would we tolerate imperfect or waxy vision? Would we tolerate glare or halos? And how do we tolerate wavefront aberrations like coma trefoil, halos, and starbursts, which I will tell you, all of you have seen in pictures, and most likely none of you have seen in person. I was a 2015 emetrope my entire life with mild presbyopia. I never wore glasses till in my 50s, and I could still read without glasses, and I could see my cell phone, and I could do most tasks without glasses. I could never use glasses in a slit lamp or a microscope. I tried monovision as I was starting to become mildly presbyopic, and it was okay for a while, but not my permanent choice, because I could still read without readers, and now I had a premature cataract. Which lens do you choose if you are in the US versus Europe? Very different. So here's what I chose. I decided I would be risk adverse to having night vision issues because I drive on the California freeways frequently to see my daughters and I have been in bad, bad traffic there and the glare and lights from the cars in my uh, eyes were already starting to be a problem from the starburst from the cataracts. And I said, I need not good night vision. So I decided against multifocal lenses when I learned about this particular lens, which was under study in the United States. It is a monofocal lens. It's got a five millimeter optic. And the theoretical concept of it was that it would be posterior placed, posteriorly placed in the bag so that all light would focus at the nodal point. It had some positive asphericity for extended depth of focus. And the first 50 patients, had a proc most had J2 to J3, which is 0.2 to 0.3 logmar, with no glare or halos reported. And I said that would be good enough for me. I didn't mind wearing a plus one contact lens in that eye if I needed to. This is what it looks like. So I chose this monofocal lens because of these, not uh, because of not wanting glare halos. I wanted no aberrations, and I wasn't a fan of monovision permanently. And this, these, and I have always been very sensitive to glare. So I came out 
20, 12 and a half. I love my distance vision. The colors are amazing. Driving day and night is spectacular, but I am one unhappy 20, 12 and a half patient who has unwanted positive dysphotopsias. And when your patient tells you about glare, don't discount this. It's enough to make you crazy. You will walk and you will see lights streaming from everywhere and every time you go to a, a window, you'll have glare and you've never had problems in your life. I will tell you that I do believe that that is quite different than halos. I think I could have tolerated halos better than day glare and night glare. So this is a problem. I am able to manage it temporarily with Alphagan, uh, P.1% bromonidine, and when my pupils are normal, I can basically tolerate it. But my pupil continues to dilate and enlarge throughout the day. How many people, how many patients of you have had this amazingly great vision? It's like HD vision, and have had these types of patients Will you remove the lens with these complaints? And we'll talk about thoughts on the dilated pupil. Was my choice adequate? What about a new lens for my first eye, for my second eye, and what about my pupil? Well, the, the problem of Sir is indeed, she made a mistake in my opinion choosing an experimental lens. And I will tell you, most of the symptoms are related to the material silicon, and we know because of the, of the crystallines can make uh, this, this type of distortion, can make uh, commaboration, radial aberrations are induced by the by silicon when the casual bag is contracted, and this happens to you in the second to the third month after the surgery. No, it was a week after. A week after? A week okay. after I started noticing halos of light and yeah. some glare. Anyway, let me explain to you how I would make, make your, your case because you are a very special case. You are a colleague. You come to me, and this is what we have to, to say. First, uh, which, is the, 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 which is the choice? We have in Europe all the lenses. Obviously, we can choose a monofocal of different types with negative phosphoricity. You have a positive phosphoricity lens, which in my opinion is other problem as well. We have different multifocal lenses. We have extended depth of field, and we have accommodative lenses. At least we have, because we are in a clinical study, and these lenses work well. But the issue is which is the right lens to make for my patient, my ophthalmologist, my friend, sorry. Indeed, I would not choose an experimental lens. Indeed, I would not choose a monofocal lens because the, uh, she's using at many distances. She, she enjoys life, she's a perfectionist, as she doesn't like to wear glasses. And I know you very well. But of course, we cannot run into the trouble of, run, of getting uh, into a uh, dysphotopsia or problems that we know that happens with some cases, and especially contrasivity loss that happens in low mesopic contrast sensitivity in all the cases, even with uh, the, the low arts in diffractive IOLs. And already, the, Dr. Grichowski has quoted my, this paper that we wrote with Edmund and Rosen. Multifocal lenses are successful. The issue is we need to use them properly, and of course, they have complications like in medicine. Now, this is another paper that he also quoted in which we review the complications, how to solve the problems. We are dealing with medicine. There is no free lunch and we have to make a decision of our colleague in the benefit of her. And these are the different choices that we have in, in, in lenses. First, diffractive lenses are in my choice. In many cases, I do about one third of my cases with diffractive, but not in the case of Surrey because she drives a lot at night in long distances. And indeed, low mesopic conditions, low mesopic driving is going to affect it somehow in, in all these lenses, which are indeed causing dispersion of light, and you have scattering as well. So we, I would go to refractive lenses and look that when choosing the lens, I have many decisions. First, incision size. I don't want to use astigmatism. You don't have astigmatism, but the astigmatism is present. I try to correct it with the lens. Then I, I, I have to look at the sphericity of the lens depending on the cornea. I have to look uh, at the pupil dynamics because pupil dynamics matters in many lenses. Some, people, some lenses are pupil independent, but some others, many, are pupil dependent. We, we need to know which, which are the best candidates for each, uh, 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 each one of the lenses, and which is the best scenario in which these lenses should work. Sorry, because this is not working. Okay, thank you. So I'll go to the refractive technology, and from the ones that we have at this moment, we have the varifocal refractive technology. These are sector lenses. They don't reduce contrast sensitivity function. They don't have a glare. 
but they have some distortion, and distortion depends on the uh, near vision ad. Near vision ad of three has somehow uh, some level of distortion. Distortion is not going to be tolerated by surgery for sure, so I would choose the low near vision ad of lenses 1.5, the lenses comfort. And why? Because I have never explanted one of these lenses because of this photopsia or because distortion or because any uh, abnormal symptoms. Second, it is a very good lens for intermediate vision and in binocular implanted, uh, most of the patients uh, uh, reach about GA3, which is enough, and to have some near vision glasses is not a tragedy. Uh, if you are really sure that you are not inducing night vision problems, uh, nuclear, halos, or dysphotopsia in, the, in daylight conditions, the lens is big enough not to have any problem with the, uh, with the people of, of surgery. And finally, uh, the best uh, scenario in this for those that are moderately tolerant, but not tolerant to, to, to distortion, not tolerant to glare, not tolerant to problems, and indeed want to have a kind of monofocal with improvements in near vision. This is the lens that I would choose for her. Indeed, the, 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 use, the lenses that I use more frequently are the refractive varifocal because this reason I use a lot the 1.5 in combination with the 3 and the, one, and the M plus uh, X, which is extra uh, near. That means it has an extra addition for near by modification of paraxial uh, power. And in this way, I use in the dominant eye the 1.5 and the non dominant then 3. And most of the cases I'm talking about, most is 99% of the cases are happy as far as you select the patient properly. This is a lens that is relatively pupil independent from 2 to 6 millimeters, which is the case of, of, of Surrey. And I could, even that I use in one third of my cases, the, the size, uh, the, the diffractive, the most. Uh, used by me is the size trifocal, but I can use the Hanita full range, which is an intermediate in the near vision art, with the important advantage that certainly you have a jagged laser casurotomy in this lens, and I have the Alcon Panoptis as well. So these are the, uh, how to make my choice. Visual potential of the patient matters, and you need to know that the patient will have good vision. The age, professional activities, hobbies, reading, and driving habits are important. No ocular comorbidities, it has been mentioned before. That doesn't matter that much, so borderline uh, maculas at this moment are an indication for me for multifocus as well. Normal coordinate topography and aberrometry, case of surgery is like that. Pupil dynamics, you have to use the, 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 the dynamic pupillometry available in the series and, and in pentacan. You need to know which is the photopic and scotopic pupil size. The angle kappa for me is not that relevant. Let me tell you, I have never explanted a case because of normal angle kappa, so it's not an issue that matters to me that much, and this probably deserves a, a, a discussion further. Patient's personality is important. She is a kind of uh, demanding, highly demanding, uh, highly perfectionist, uh, sophisticated lady, and indeed she is a challenge, but she is an indication for multifocal lenses as well. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm going to give you a little bit of food for thought about what goes into the presbyopia assessment, and we're going to see patients and doctors in a short little while discussing the decisions they made. So I think man's evolution is looking like this. We, we don't want to wear spectacles for reading anymore. And so Simon Sinek is someone who looks at everything and says, starts with why. I tend to think of the presbyopia market as start with what. What do I have that I can currently offer, and how do I make that fit? What my patients have? How are we going to get to that decision? What are the cost-benefit ratios, the risk-benefit ratios, and what's the technology development cycle? So refractive assessments, when I'm spending a day seeing young LASIK patients, that's how the day goes. There's just no decisions to be made. It's just good fun. Are you a good candidate? Let's go ahead. When we're seeing patients who are presbyopic age and they want a glasses-free solution, we start looking at issues like this, and before long, this is what we're doing. You're tearing your hair out. You're just making too many decisions, thinking about too many things. So this is some of the things we consider when we look at a presbyopia who wants to be free of glasses. So historically, we'd ask things like, what are your needs? What is your definition of success? In, under what circumstances will you be prepared to wear glasses? And when will you certainly not want to wear glasses? Use a computer. But where is that computer? Can you move that computer? What are your hobbies? And then there's another issue, and I'm looking just for the moment at the two big groups, the IOLs versus um, corneal surgeries. And depending on your age, you tend to be in one of the two categories. Depending on uh, what your risk, uh, people think, patients think, laser is a lot safer than going inside the eye, irrespective of what we, what we think. Um, what's the anatomy of the eye look like? 
What about the cost? Costs tend to be less for laser. What about the new entity of um, dysfunctional lens syndrome? That's becoming a lot more important. Thank you, Dan. And if someone has early changes, we need to consider those. Myopes tend to do better with laser vision correction. Hyperopes tend to do better with lens um, procedures. If we've done a contact lens trial, someone who's good with monovision can opt for laser correction. Someone who prefers the multifocality tends to go with an IOL. Um, what about your health insurance? If you have no health insurance, it might be a good decision now to do a lens-based procedure and you're done for life. If you have health insurance that covers cataracts in the future, you can do laser now and do a cataract surgery another day. Are you on medications that are going to introduce cataracts? So there are lots of things that come into the decision-making process. So yeah, being in Germany, there's a Porsche on the left and there's a, a new phone on the right. And if you're of the mindset that you've got to wait for something better, you'll never land up doing anything. So at some point, you've got to make a decision. This is the best I can do for now. But in this innovation cycle with lenses, it's quite interesting when you look at a young person. In my mind now, I'm a young person's 50, who's thinking about presbyopia correction. Is do you implant a 2018 lens or you go for a different solution, and in 20 years' time when you have a cataract, implant a 2038 lens, because they're going to look different. The lenses I use today are very different to what they looked 10 years ago, and they are very good and they are a whole lot better now. So ocular surface, we had very good talks about this. I'm not going to go into this, but you can't really address presbyopia without looking at the ocular surface. And we have very good tools today like HD Analyzer, which for me, amongst all the other things it does, but showing the patient the optical quality of the tear is very, very useful. Another device I think we need is one that does a subtraction for us between internal optics and external optics, and that helps with making decisions about what the best route is to go. So blended vision is the thing we use most. Um, we tend to do it by preserving distance stereo vision, and that tends to keep patients happy. And the key thing about this approach is whatever you haven't hit, you can still target or you can still correct with glasses. Presby LASIK, uh, Presby whichever way you look at it, has never gained widespread popularity. Corneal inlays, in fact, I'm speaking about corneal inlays in an hour, so I won't go into that now. And then the premium presbyopia correcting lenses, you can see how wide they are, and you can see um, on this list is the opportunity to adjust or change lenses post-operatively, and that's going to become um, an important issue in the future. So the process is you have this conversation, you go through possibilities, you have to make this decision based on all these things we spoke about. You look at some hard data, some, um, at the tears and the, the lens itself, and then you proceed with surgery. But the major decisions you're making are still based on a functional assessment and on patient subjective data. So I think this is one of the problems. When you have so much subjective data, how do you make a good decision about how to meet that? And you've got these vague requirements of what you need to do with very specific solutions and how you match them up. So a possible solution is ob obtaining objective data and measuring, and this device measures the working distance you're at, the head position you're in, the ambient light. And then gives you a very good idea of how you're spending your time and what your working distances are personally. And then this is the pilot study we did. And even the patient who thought, and that's the bottom right, who thought that they only have a distance requirement. So this is the person who spent most of the time at distance, still spent 53% of the time at intermediate or near. So today's lifestyle needs near vision. And then you get a personal defocus curve. And you're trying to apply this defocus curve to what you need. This is me wearing the device one day during a LASIK list. And you can see how I'm spending my time looking up at the monitors, looking into the microscope, and looking down at the, um, the surgery. So now what? Now we have a very specific requirement of what the patient needs. And they have an, they have an understanding of what they need. They suddenly realize they need help up close. And so now what we do is we match defocus curves and looking at the patient's personal defocus curve requirements versus the, the solution's defocus curve. And so we had a very good talk yesterday, just yesterday from Dr. Fernandez on what is that defocus curve? Is it the workbench curve or is it what really, how that IOL would behave in your eye? So we've done some ray tracing studies looking at real patients realize that all required a 23 to after lens. We did the ray tracing on a particular lens and found that they give different defocus curves depending on the anatomy of your eye. And then the same type of lens in a 10 diopter configuration versus a 28 diopter configuration, again, gives a very, very different defocus curve. So today, all of us in our clinics have devices that allow us to create a virtual eye. We've got all the, inf all the information we need. 
And once you've created the virtual eye, you can place any one of these technologies into that eye and then compare the defocus curve from that technology for that eye and then collect, uh, select the most appropriate solution based on the objective data and ray tracing the solution. So potentially, my hope is that one day when I walk into the clinic and it's a whole day full of preserve hopes, that I'll still be feeling like this instead of tearing my hair out. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, uh, at first I would like to thank the organizing committee to invite me to deliver this talk. Uh, my affiliations are in Poland. One of them is in China. This is a recent appointment, but the talk will be delivered in English. Uh, here are my <laughs> financial disclosures. None of them is relevant to the talk, to, the, to this uh, um, talk. And I would like to address one of the uh, mm, well-known um, statements. Uh, 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 as you see it on the slide, multifocal IELTS decrease the contrast sensitivity, thus they are disrecommended in patients with retinal uh, disorders. What is the evidence behind this statement? So there are many uh, um, studies uh, showing that uh, multifocal IELTS, uh, they decrease the uh, contrast sensitivity. This is one of them. It was published uh, in uh, uh, Ophthalmology 2004. Uh, however, as we know, uh, the more reliable data and the deeper insight we gain from systemic reviews and meta-analysis. So the question is, what do they say? This is one of the meta-analysis. It was published in Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery by Rosen and, and uh, collaborators. And they uh, found uh, 31 studies which uh, compared the outcomes of uh, uh, multifocal IOL versus monofocal IOL in terms of uh, contrast sensitivity. And they found in this meta-analysis that in one-third there was no difference. In two-third there was reduced contrast sensitivity at the highest special, uh, special frequencies for multifocal IOLs. Also, contrast sensitivity outcomes uh, remained within the age match uh, normal range. They also pointed that uh, uh, comparing uh, contrast sensitivity outcomes was very difficult because of variation of the tests used, uh, illumination levels, and inconsistency in reported uh, uh, varieties. And the second <coughs> systemic review, which was recently published, uh, more or less delivered the similar results. They pointed that uh, um, there were different methods used in different studies, so it was very difficult to compare, tested under varying lighting conditions, and uh, for example, pooled results of four trials did not reveal a significant difference in contrast sensitivity. Uh, they also pointed that 13 randomized controlled trials compared, uh, which compared contrast sensitivity under varying luminance conditions and at different spatial frequencies shown a disadvantage for multifocal IL under at least some conditions. Case control studies, they deliver more or less similar results. So they say that some, uh, they show some advantage in contrast sensitivity with monofocal lenses. Uh, it was also uh, shown that uh, there are some factors which uh, can improve contrast sensitivity. They include rotationally asymmetric designs, diffractive optics, aspheric design, and some of these uh, factors were already introduced in some of the multifocal IOLs. So uh, the old studies might not be relevant today, uh, regarding, hmm, as it is shown here, for example, this is the, the, the recent study published last year, uh, prospective single blind comparative study, which show no statistical significant differences in contrast sensitivity observed at any CPD uh, in multifocal IELTS versus monofocal IELTS. So there are many uh, questions still to be answered regarding uh, multifocal IOLs and contrast sensitivity. What levels should be considered 
normal given uh, the large standard deviation of contrast sensitivity in normal subjects. Whether multifocal IRs should be compared with age-matched uh, FACIC subjects or age-matched subject with a monofocal IOL. Uh, then if we observe any decrease in uh, contrast sensitivity, it's, uh, is it clinically significant? Is it clinically relevant? Is there a threshold in the contrast sensitivity to contraindicate multifocal IRs? Uh, and finally, uh, the uh, issue of pre-existing impairment of contrast sensitivity, such as those with concurrent diseases. There is uh, uh, another interesting uh, study, very old, 18 years ago, published in, of, uh, in Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery, uh, based on an old uh, multifocal IOL. Uh, it is an array. Uh, um, multifocal IOL, and they shown in this study that uh, um, uh, they, they, they analyzed uh, um, the influence of contrast sensitivity. Uh, it, uh, the decrease uh, was significant only at low contrast levels when compared with monofocal IOLs and uh, equivalent uh, uh, to one line of visual acuity when the contrast was reduced to 11%. However, uh, advantage of providing improved, uncorrected, near visual acuity uh, counterbalanced uh, the uh, loss of contrast sensitivity. So they, they concluded uh, that this significant proportion of patients benefited from the IOS multifocality and the uh, management of associated eye diseases was not compromised by the nature of the IOL. What do we know about the relation between, uh, uh, we call it concurrent diseases, different retinal disorders? So uh, regarding maculopathy, uh, contrast sensitivity reduction uh, from multifocal IOLs is additive to the already reduced contrast sensitivity in patients with maculopathy. However, patients with maculopathy and limited vision loss could benefit from multifocal IOLs given that they are more tolerant to image defocus and adapt more rapidly. Uh, what do we know about the uh, diabetic retinopathy, AMD? Not much. Studies on contrast sensitivity and functional vision after multifocal IOLs implantation in these disorders have not been conducted, so uh, this implantation are based on individual case selection. Uh, this is another interesting uh, study uh, which uh, was pu published uh, uh, a few years ago in June of Cataract Refractive Surgery. And in uh, this study, patients with AMD and cataract were implanted uh, Restore uh, multifocal IOL with the ad, near ad uh, um, of uh, four diopters targeting two spherical equivalent diopters, yield, which yielded uh, finally uh, five diopters total near ad. And uh, they reported, <clears throat> after six months, improved uncorrected uh, near visual acuity in 90% of eyes, and uh, they also uh, reported significant improvements in uh, vision, mental health symptoms due to vision, and role difficulties due to vision. Uh, finally, uh, also bilateral multifocal intraocular lens implant is probably the most uh, favorable uh, unilateral implantation of multifocal IOLs may also provide patients with high levels of spectacle independence without compromising contrast sensitivity, especially in some age groups like young patients. Uh, what do we know about dysphotopsia? It is uh, rather clear, it comes also from a uh, recent Cochrane review uh, that uh, multifocal IELs are related with the increased risk of dysphotopsia, uh, glare, even more for halos, two times uh, the risk uh, for, for halos. And uh, the same Cochrane uh, review tried to address the issue of uh, uh, patient satisfaction and quality of life. It was very difficult because there is a great inconsistency between studies. There are so many different uh, uh, visual function questionnaires. It's so difficult to compare them that uh, they, they were not able really 
to, to draw uh, reliable conclusions, there is some evidence of more favorable outcomes in the multifocal group. So in the conclusion, uh, we really uh, uh, do not understand well uh, the role of contrast sensitivity decrease even it's statistically significant, is it clinically relevant, uh, um, and so uh, there are some uh, obvious uh, dysphotopsia um, uh, related with multifocal IOLs, and there is no universally accepted and standard validated measure of patient satisfaction after multifocal IOL implantation. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I would like to invite everybody interested in our Presbyopia meeting in, in Poland. Thank you very much. Well, I feel a little bit like Daniel in the lion's den. Um, this is a difficult task, obviously. So, first of all, um, my financials. Uh, now, am I an appropriate person to give this talk? Uh, one of my um, predecessors, John Marshall, uh, almost 300 uh, years ago, uh, invented a new type of lens. So he was a wonderful innovator and was rewarded by the Royal Society. Um, I became master of the Spectacle Makers in London, which is the oldest optical organization in the world, founded in 1629. And it was founded, like most English things, to keep out cheap European imports, particularly, <laughs> particularly from Holland. Okay. Now, first of all, is there a need for anterior segment approaches? Well, in 1868, you see this uh, gentleman visiting London, kept getting spat upon, and then asked the servant lady why, and she said, well, I should have bad luck if I didn't spit upon a gentleman in glasses. Okay, so there is a need, clearly. Who should do it? Well, I looked at the oldest textbook of ophthalmology I could find, which was German, and it's very good advice that surgeons shouldn't be straight from the manure wagon. Uh, interestingly, a uh, comment on refractive surgery, you've got to be ambidextrous, must not be greedy for money or haughty. Now, I don't know any ophthalmologists who uh, do that. Uh, and... Um, well, you, you can read them for yourselves. Now, the problem that you all have is you're dealing with something which is incredibly complex. You're dealing with the eye at one end, which is involved in image production, transduction, processing, and transmission, and you're dealing at the other end with the brain, which is reviewing all those, adding more uh, transduction and uh, interactive mechanisms, and all of this is under genetic control. So it's an incredible journey from fiddling around with the cornea uh, and getting the patient responses. It's much more complex than we thought. The other thing you have to remember is it's a dynamic system. Nothing is static there. The cornea is moving. The lens is moving, thank goodness. There's a wonderful dash pop filter at the uh, sulcus scleri, which filters out corneal movements from uh, the retina. Okay. How do you make the judgments you make? Well, I do a lot of work with the military, both in the UK and in the US, and they're great with acronyms. In the UK, it's FICE, Faith, Ignorance, Conceit, Enthusiasm. That's how you can go wrong. You believe what the manufacturers tell you. You've no idea what the mechanism is. You're conceited and know that you can do it, or you're really enthusiastic and you want to do it. In America, money. They may pay you to do it. Ideology, God bless America. Uh, conceit and uh, enthusiasm. Now, I should declare um, a vested interest in what I'm going to say next. Uh, I was chairman at St. Thomas's Hospital on the side of the Thames, which is where Sir Howard Ridley did all his early surgery for cataract. At the age of four, he sat on the lap of Florence Nightingale, a, a, an eminent nurse, who was supported by Sir William Bowman, 
um, in the design of the hospital, which was designed actually to limit infection in a big London hospital. It was built on a cholera-ridden swamp, typical English planning. <laughs> so I'm very proud to say I knew, I knew Ridley, uh, who knew Florence Nightingale, who knew Sir William Bowman. So that's my links. Uh, I should tell you one story of um, Ridley. He was a very restful man. And he met one of my colleagues for the first time in the corridor, a long corridor on the south wing at St. Thomas's, Peter Hamilton, who was his last resident, and said to him, haven't seen you here before, my boy. What's the first thing you're going to do with my cataract patients? And Peter was completely stunned and really said, enema, enema. They're going to have a GA and I don't want a mess, enema, and walked away. So remember, we've moved on a long way. Okay, now for all of us, there is a real, real problem. Ridley, one of Ridley's fellows, noticed with Ridley that they weren't getting infection from uh, perspex shrapnel in the eyes during the last war from spitfires and hurricanes. And the student said, why don't we make a lens like that and put it in the eye? So it wasn't really Ridley's idea, but Ridley took it up immediately and walked with it. Now, I call this the clash of the knights or poisonous peers. All of us are going to suffer at some point in our life from poisonous peers. It may not be what we're doing is wrong, but they have an opinion and can't be broken. If you think of... Uh, Sir Stuart Duke Elder, he was the real power in English ophthalmology and was knighted shortly after uh, writing his textbooks and, in theory, operating on a prime minister. In fact, it was one of his fellows. Um, but Ridley took 50 years from his early IOL work through to getting a knighthood because of Sir Stuart's attitude. So Stuart walked out of Ridley's lecture at the Oxford Congress, and for 50 years, Ridley was in the wilderness in the UK. It really took a little bit of time until uh, Kelman came up with FACO that IOL surgery even become accepted in UK, and you, in Moorfields was one of the last hospitals to adapt uh, to using intraocular lenses. And since then, we've had an explosion from Iris Clip, we've had angle supported accommodative lenses. You've heard all about them at these, uh, the meeting today. Um, uh, and we've had swinging haptics to give us a degree of accommodation. We try multiple refractive zones, uh, all sorts of things. I have to say, like Sherry, my opinion at the moment is when I come for my cataract, I'm going to have a straight spherical collection, perhaps with a little blue blocking. Now, I know that Burkhart hates this, but just think about this for a moment. 1985, all the lens manufacturers introduced UV block. There was no clinical trial. There's no evidence-based medicine at all. Everybody says, yeah, we have to have it. If I said to you, would you put a lens in without it, you'd probably say, no way. But... When Alcon introduced their blue blocking lens, which personally I think is a great idea, no clinical trials, huge controversy, oh, we can't do it without clinical trials. Uh, well, you know, damn it, a few years before we did precisely that. Okay, I want to move very quickly from lens to cornea. And here our first big mistake came from Sato in Japan not knowing the function of the corneal endothelium. So here we had a surgery based on uh, radial incisions from inside the eye, and of course, within a few years, all his corneas decompensated and got a huge uh, backlash from the community. Fyodorov, on the other hand, thought, wow, what about if we did it from outside the eye and the old Soviet Union was strapped for cash, and this was a good way to get hard currency. And people from all over the world went to sit on his carousel to have radio keratotomy. Again, was it a mistake? Well, I call it slash for cash. 
He had the surgery, the idea being you make the incision, it fills up with epithelial cells and the wounds uh, gape, so you increase the effective uh, peripheral circumference. It wasn't until George Waring III did the Perk study that we really saw that this was leading to major problems with hypropic shift. Okay, well, moving on. The next advent was uh, Exzyma laser refractive surgery. Myself and Teo there with uh, PRK, Lucio, and uh, Ionis with uh, LASIK. And you have to remember, none of this would have happened without industry and in the spirit of ACOS, David Muller and Charlie Munnerlin did a fantastic job. It wouldn't have happened without industry taking up these ideas and uh, moving with it. Originally, I had patents on broad beam, shaping of the cornea through a computer-driven aperture, but this had problems with the pulses arriving as the plume came out of the surface, and some companies had problems with central islands. So we shifted, as we saw yesterday, oh, to flying coffee, um, to scanning laser systems, which are the, the basis of our systems today. Now, what's the mistake? Well, I think there was a big mistake in terms of LASIK. Who would want to put dead epithelial cells back on top of a wound? It's a bit like a blister from Vern. The cells are there, sure, they're retaining fluid, sure, but they're not going to do any, any work. And that's why work from Ramesh, who's in the audience here, showed that if you actually totally killed the cells, you did better in terms of post-operative recovery than if you tried to cleave it off and be very careful. So what are the issues? Well, the issues are still the same issues that have been around for a long time. The front of the eye, we've had wave fronts, we're looking at aberrations. The back of the eye, we're looking at point spread function and interaction of the retina with the brain. Optical aberrations, they're not monochromatic. They are polychromatic. Our eyes are polychromatic. Most of the systems we have at the moment are monochromatic solutions. Uh, with one of my PhD students, we developed a polychromatic model, but it's not used. And in wavefront calculations, we really should be looking at this. We don't want a beam that's perfectly focused in the middle of the choroid. A lot of good, so we shouldn't be using red, we should be using perhaps blue or green, but it's a good idea to become more polychromatic. What access are we going to use? Well, again, huge debate, debate always have been optic access, visual access, line of sight, and I guess really line of sight is what we should be doing, but of course that involves personalized medicine again. The manufacturers several years ago promised us eagle vision. Well, that was an act of faith, and Barricare had it right. The achievement of super functions still in the realm of utopia and probably cloud of DNA. Eagle vision also suffers from ignorance. How many people here know that the eagle has two foveas in each eye and a million cones in each fovea? So we're now going to be dependent on the retinal surgeons to transplant in a second <laughs> fovea. I, I think that would perhaps increase visual acuity by a factor of eight at least. So finally, I want to leave you with uh, an observation on what you are all doing. This is an eye. We divide it into two, front and back. The net flow of fluid <coughs> excuse me, around the eye, endothelium's pumping into the AC, ciliary processes are pumping into the AC, the pigment epithelium's pumping out of the eye. But the feeders are in the opposite direction. So we've got fluid coming in and out and pumps, and it's a very, very complex mechanism. So just look at the uh, front of the eye for a moment. Fluid's coming out of the ciliary processes, around the back of the lens, out through the pupil, into the trabecular meshwork, and out of the eye. Great. But 
That's the system you're dealing with with cataract surgery. Those are the zonules. They are pretty tough. They're like Amazon roots. They go down into the crypts between the plications of the pars plicata and anchor in there. And then the long elements go back all the way to the pars planar. And actually, some elements are seen in the very superficial uh, Brooks membrane. So now you're going to start tugging away there during surgery. You're all very clever, and you're not going to touch it. But of course you are. And um, if you think of the vitreous, the other game here, we've got the anterior vitreous base, which in my eyes is a swinging hammock. We've got a premacular bursa of attachment. We've got the disc attachment. And we are fiddling around with all of this, so it's perhaps not surprising that a complication is something we ought to watch. Fortunately, it's minimal, is macular edema. And that probably stems from the fact that you're interfering with this really complex mechanism. Mr. Chairman, I know there's coffee next, so I leave you with my final slide, a mistake which we haven't made yet, but please don't. <laughs> Thank you very much.